Nazgul is an assistant professor at um, UTSA uh, for the geography department and um, political science. And uh, so the rate of professor, I mean, I, I rely on it because I'm back in school and I want to know how the professors are. But uh, it, they had rave reviews about her. Her students were all, all about her awesomeness, how great she was, how funny she was, how intelligent she was, and that was enough for us. We said, okay, that was, it was 51 ratings on there and not a one of them were, were bad, not a one of them. So Nazgul uh, means cute flower. And I'm staring right at her, and she's absolutely adorable. She's lively, and I think you're really going to enjoy her talk. I mean, she's a feminist geographer. What is that? I can't wait to hear all about that. Um, she grew up in Tehran, Iran. Uh, and okay, so this is really incredible. I just have to say this, and then I'll bring her up on the stage. Bachelor's degree in architecture. Two years later, a computer science degree. A year later, a master's degree in urban design and planning, and then in 2013, she earned her PhD in geography and sociology. So she is here to share her story and um, all of her knowledge with us, and so I want to welcome to the stage Dr. Nazgul Bogari. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nazgul. Good morning. Yes. And uh, I'm so honored and thrilled to be the very first female keynote speaker here in 2016. Uh, thank you, Mr. Richard Wade, uh, Tendris, right? And Felicia, Patricia, Katie Wilson. Thank you, those of my colleagues and students who drove this morning uh, around 5 a.m., 3 a.m., something like that, right? Uh, to come here. Uh, I would say it is about the time to have a female uh, presidential candidate. Oops, I made a mistake. I mean, keynotes, right? <laughs> so, keynote and uh, 2016 is a good time. I just had uh, one flyer it says uh, today is the day. So, hopefully, Today or this year is the year uh, that we are getting more familiar with uh, new ideas, right? And uh, thank, a special thanks to my students and colleagues who came all the way. The reason I purposefully asked them to come on top of the academic networking is that I do make uh, some jokes, but nobody really laughs in my classes. Because, you know, jokes don't translate. I'm originally Iranian from Farsi language. So they're here, they will be laughing, so please join them, right? So before I go, I changed my uh, title, right? As you can see, the F word, right? I thought to be a little bit more in line with our presidential debate, the language they're using. So we are going to have the, yes. And as Richard mentioned earlier, right? Uh, rich, you go with rich, right? Uh, so Texas is the state of mind, not a place. So hopefully I will not be offending anybody but that feminist uh, GIS or the F word that I'm going to talk. My whole goal is going to be presenting the invisible and also represent and tell the story and empower minorities. And we shall go ahead and see what we can do that through GIS. A little bit background of me that uh, Felicia kindly went over it is that I was coming from a very single word uh, kind of perspective uh, in my bachelor. Computer science, it's very science, architecture, it's kind of art and science together. So when I was traveling around the world or in Iran, as you can see, I was kind of more focused on the beauty, the formal, the visual dimensions of the public spaces, of the cities I was going, right? You can see uh, pictures. There is, uh, yes. So you can see pictures. This is the Isfahan, the half of the world kind of artistic place in Iran. This is Yaz. Uh, this is Switzerland, uh, Zurich. This is uh, Tokyo. Wherever I was going through my bachelor, I was mostly focused and engaged with the visual. But later on, when I go through my uh, master's degree, I became more interested in parallel words and kind of trying to uh, extend my horizon when I was going to cities, right? So I've uh, 
notice there are different dimensions of cities and public spaces that we are uh, going through and experiencing every day, right? So I was noticing in this picture that, yes, we are going to have problem for disabled, right? What's going on? Are we making our cities friendly for women or disabled? Are we uh, paying attention to the kind of informal economics, informal uh, uh, interactions, experiences that are happening in the city? This is me in Japan in 2013. I'm mostly interested in non-Western societies, right, because they are uh, re uh, underrepresented in English language. So hopefully I get that project done soon. I'm uh, working on what feminist geography means in Japanese context, and of course in Iranian. And uh, I also noticed that there is something going on in this picture. Thankfully, for beginning of 2000, we see uh, female participants. So women are in both sides of the table, right? They are. They used to be mostly in that part, behind in the service or serving the staff, right? Now we are seeing more professor, more academic, more researcher. So the space and gender is playing here. We have been talking, right, about the grandfather, no offense, father, whatever, you look more than a father than grandfather to me, but let's, oh, you are the grandfather, there we go. But we do talk. <laughs> He did actually ask me to have a picture this morning with him, and I'm honored, thank you. But uh, about the grandfather and father, we don't really hear about mothers and grandmothers, right? So how many of you knows any of this female? Before I get to the F word, feminist geography, you know. Yes, hi, Caroline, how are you doing? So you know, how many of you know? Can you raise your hand, please? Well, my student better know. We're getting F, right? So this is Jane Jacobs, right? She was an urban, she was an academic. She's an urban anthropologist, urban, uh, urban residence in New York City, right? She wrote a lot. If you happen to New York Times, there was a uh, very recent article about her. She does care about the sense of place and neighborhood and those dimensions other than uh, uh, visual and formal that I was becoming interested. So Jane Jacobs cares a lot so we can about the other dimension, the social, cultural, human dimension of the neighborhood. This is Janice Monk and this is Susan Hansen, right? Some of you might know them. They are the mothers of feminist geography, right? And following up them, I was becoming more interested in those dimensions that are more invisible, intangible, right? Today I'm hoping to share a story, share my thoughts about uh, an architect, what it is I am, I'm an architect, with some ethnographic skills and sensibility, right, which I have. When, what happened to that architect when she goes to and experience public spaces, to go through the cities, right? trying to define feminist geography through my own experience, right? So we were go I was going to different places, right? For example, here in Iran, we see this, is, this lady is a fashion police and this woman is just a regular citizen like myself. She feels a little bit unwelcome in public spaces because of her appearance, right? So I was paying attention who is getting a right to the city, right? Some of you might be familiar with the right to the city literature. It's a r rich literature in urban geography that we do talk about who has access to public goods. For example, good uh, HEBs, which is the central market. Where are they usually located? Whole food, where are they usually located? You probably, some of your parents, where are you going to buy a house to send your kids to the best like public school, right? Those kind of space politics. Here we have San Antonio homeless person, or we have in Ohio this lady who is trying to, um, this, she's disabled and trying to pass the public space or the street actually, right? This is Japan, Tokyo. Because it was so much hex, sexual harassment against women during the um, uh, rush hours, they decided to go ahead and have a female only wagons or cars, subway cars. And don't get excited, it happens in our own country in New York City too as well, right? But here, 
there is another uh, group, minority, children, right, that we should start caring about. Are our streets physically and socially safe and secure for our students, right? And look at this picture. This was the one that I kind of decided to become uh, an urban planner. That's Tehran subway. Do you see how many uh, uh, stairs is there? And yes, you're going to tell me there's going to be some electrical stairs, elevator they call them, whatever they call, right? So these are the stairs and it happens in Tehran because we do have rain. It's not the desert, right? We have different part of Iran. The more central part is a uh, desert, but, the Tehran, but Tehran itself, the capital city, is a very kind of cold place, very close to the mountains. So as you can see, these electrical elevator or steps can become uh, not working and whenever we have the flood, and I was going to show you, yes, we do get flood. That's a picture of the flood in Tehran. So just imagine a lady, a pregnant lady, or a disabled, or um, uh, a woman with a stroller that has to go up and down for this uh, uh, stairs, right? So this is, these were the question that architect was asking. Who is participating? What is represented? Who is included and who is empowered, right? So these are the questions that we are going to ask in feminist geography. So feminist geography is, uh, I would like to kind of uh, resemble it to a marriage. And as you can imagine, as like a lot of marriages, it's going to have some problems, but the problems in this marriage is going to be much more philosophical. So space and genders are meeting and we know that feminists are using gender as a metaphor, as a category of analysis, right? It's easy to kind of put together feminists and gender and geography together. Geography or geographers, on the other hand, use the metaphor of a space, right? Trying to understand the spatial boundaries and the spatial patterns. So what uh, feminist geographers do, they use gendered boundaries, gender, the spatial pattern. So they bring that kind of identity, they borrow that from feminists and bring that. They study the space in terms of gender spatial patterns, right? As I mentioned earlier, the marriage becomes a little bit more problematic because gender is only one category of our differences, right? So we do have other kinds of differences, race, right? We do have problem in the uh, United States here, the Black Lives Matter, right? Another example of the race would be some of the gated community which are popping out here. I mean, they are in San Antonio, but you guys have it in Austin. Uh, a lot of them in Los Angeles were happening during 90s, right? So we do have class happening too and other uh, axes of difference. Our sexuality matters, right? There are some anti Korean, um, an anti-LGBT group uh, while I was in Tokyo, rebel in Tokyo in public spaces. Uh, gender matters, of course, this is the UK parliament, majority men, and as I can see here, I'm very thankful for the female who came here, but as we all know, GIS is a very male dominant, still a very male dominant um, uh, discipline or profession. As, um, you said, Felicia, there's no intent to not include women, but I would like to see there's an intention there to include women, right? So that would be really good to see. We also have some disability, as I mentioned, ethnicity, our religion sometimes get into the fight when we are using the public spaces. Remember right after the 9-11? And sometimes right now, thanks to some of our Debater, we are going to have that kind of hostile relationship between religious again, unfortunately, in the United States. So you see, all of these are the axes of difference. So feminist geographers go beyond, right, the gender itself and bring, since 2000, they bring more axes of differences into their studies, right? As examples, those are the ones that I just uh, put in this uh, uh, slide. 
So let's talk about what feminist geography or feminist theories and politics have contributed to the discipline of geography. How many of you are geographers? Well, great. So let's see what feminists did. I'm not, I wasn't even feminist. I wasn't even a uh, geographer. I didn't know feminist geographer existed when I was in Iran, right? So I was just asking those questions. Thankfully, when I came to United States back in 2008, I was uh, seeing that Susan Hansen and Janice Monk started the scholarship and I just followed their path. But let's see briefly what they have contributed to our discipline, geography. So feminists do really care about every life, uh, everyday life, right? They care about what's happening in our life, normal people life, everyday life matters, right? They also care and critically analyze situated knowledge. What that means? That means we as feminists believe that knowledge is partial, right? It is uh, depending on the context, right? What do you think about when I, you see me, right, with my scarf, right? You might think I'm Muslim. You might think uh, I'm not Muslim because I don't have the scarf on my uh, head, right? So that's, but when you see me in a conference talking about feminist geography in the context of this conference, your perspective, your perception of me might change. If you see me in a bar drinking, your perception might change too. So situated knowledge, means that our knowledge is situated based on the context, right, and based on uh, what's happening at the time. Then another thing about feminist geographers, or feminists in general, is that they take their time to talk with people, right, engage with the local communities. That's why ethnography, talking with people, writing down uh, interviews, right, spending lots of time in the context with the people who are we are studying is important for them. We also uh, appreciate and recognize the importance of our emotions, right? Our qualitative data that is uh, happening in urban public spaces or urban areas. Well, how do we feel? Do we feel kind of welcome uh, in this um, conference, one of my students, Jackie, earlier was saying that GIS is a little bit male dominated and a lot of female, especially young female, might not feel comfortable or welcome coming to pr this profession, right, Jackie? So how do we feel about these public spaces? Do we feel welcome? So we do value emotion. We also are brave enough to uh, explore new methods, right? And we, critis we criticize the dominant system. If GIS is supposed to be a positivist or uh, quantitative G uh, method, we are going to challenge that. And in a minute, we are going to talk about that. We also talk about and care about power relationship, right? How many of you know where's GIS? I mean, everybody knows, right? What is the uh, origin of GIS? Origin of GIS, when, what, what was the main reason we came up with the idea of GIS? Yes, and what was the reason behind it? I mean, the actual GIS coming from MIT, right? And Harvard, uh, the geospatial map, right? Trying to answer some military base. So, well, in feminist geography, you're asking, is that what we want to do, military? Is GIS only answering our state needs or military needs? So we do care about how the knowledge is produced. Is the knowledge produced by the African American in uh, some uh, racial, ethnical enclaves in San Antonio, uh, who are, happen to live in mostly in eastern part of the San Antonio, or is it coming from the higher level, which is the state, right? So that matters. Who is producing the knowledge is very, very important because as we talk about it later, knowledge is uh, very situated and subject to change, right? As feminists, we also believe in multiple truths. What that means when I came earlier, when I talked earlier about different type of uh, words, we believe that even contrasting right, truths can uh, exist, coexist. So we accept different 
perspectives. And at the end, feminists highlight the importance of context and identity and place, what's happening in the context in uh, geography. So we, as geographer, what was happening in 1930s in this country, we were going to different uh, um, exotic places such as China or Persia or Egypt and coming back and saying that this is what's happening, right, uh, in Asia, in uh, what we used to call uh, the Orient, right, wrongly, we used to call that. But what I'm trying to say is that there was a huge difference between the researcher and the research, right? There wasn't any relationship. The researcher, usually being a white male, uh, middle age going to these exotic places and study what's happening there, right? What is the uh, origin of geography as a discipline? Geography used to be all over, right, the world. What is the, those of you geographers, origin of our discipline? Colonialism. Colonialism, thank you, yes. It's coming from the UK. That's what you see, we have a lot of British faculty in our geography department. So it's coming from uh, colonialism, trying to kind of uh, explore the exotic places, right? So what do we do as a feminist geographer, as I mentioned, and we are going to focus on this in this uh, presentation, is critically exploring new methods. And what do I mean by that? I'm going to, now that we get uh, kind of, uh, we take care of the F board, the feminist geography board, right? Let's go ahead and see what is feminist uh, uh, GIS means, right? So a little bit background about uh, how or the history of uh, Qualitative GIS, we also call it critical GIS or feminist, uh, feminist GIS, right? It's coming from that sheer enthusiasm in during 1980s and 90s, when majority of you probably remember in this profession that we got so excited about GIS that's going to, and some of the Esri, we have Esri people here, right? So yes, some of the books that is published by Esri is like, Let's go change the uh, word by GIS. We can change the word by GIS. GIS was kind of a solution, right? So we have that kind of positivist uh, quantitative tool as a GIS to go and save the word. So here, as uh, Michael Goodchild mentioned, we are going to have a GIS that's accommodating all kinds of data. We can include all kinds of data and we can solve all of our problems. But Later on, in mid-90s, right, Eric Shepard is coming out in one of his uh, very good, very well-written article, what kind of geography for what kind of uh, society. He does a uh, response to that critique uh, and criticize those sheer enthusiasm around the GIS to be to uh, kind of being introduced as a quantitative and merely subject, objective and uh, kind of going to answer all of our questions. He suggests here that we need to go beyond quantitative methods. If we are claiming we are a democratic society, we do need to kind of include different kind of plural approaches and opinions. So it's saying that the technology is suggesting that technology should not at least us researchers should not limit us to only quantitative. We should include all kinds of data, right, uh, and under, in understanding our world. So in kind of summary, right, as Dennis Wood has uh, smartly suggested, the reason that map lies are their ability, right, to Erase the distinction between the reality, this one, and the representation. This is my best friend in Iran, Tehran. This is Tehran. Oh, yes, we do have mountains there too. And it does snow too. So there is a difference between reality and the representation, right? That, uh, and that's why GIS and any kind, with any kind of map, we can actually lie. But what is about qualitative GIS is that we are going to bring that human agency, agency back, right? So that's important. In qualitative GIS, we are coupling qualitative data, such as ethnography, 
and those of you in academic or profession probably know how expensive and time consuming it is to do ethnographic uh, or qualitative uh, research, right? So we are going to bring back that human agency, uh, back to that equ uh, equation of representation and the reality, to bring them closer to each other. So this is just a very quick history kind of diagram of the qualitative GIS. So just around 1990s, we started questioning the GIS positivity, right? Uh, uh, post positivist, post structuralist approach tried in geography specifically by critical and feminist geographer tried to bring back that human geography to physical geography, getting rid of those um, binary categorization that really don't exist in our everyday life, right? We just do that sometimes for some reason, physical, uh, human, but uh, in, the, in reality, they are both together, right? And around 2000, early 2000s, we started exploring new methods, right? New qualitative approaches in GIS. We have people who started writing down, this is the LA Los Angeles riot, if you remember that uh, anti-African uh, American or happening kind of history happens again or in a different format, but this uh, scholar started doing, uh, uh, mapping the narratives and what's happening there, right? Another a scholar bringing children and ask them to do some sketches, right? Another scholar, another critical geographer is uh, including spatial behavior maps. So they are trying to bring different type different way of seeing the world into GIS. Not just quantitative, but some messy and complex qualitative data, right? And then these are some of the examples. So wide application of the hybrid method. So we have those quantitative uh, GIS data, those layers that we are all obsessed and work with them, and then we are trying to make another GIS layer with those qualitative data, right? And the qualitative GIS has been called other things, such as feminist geographer, right? Uh, feminist uh, GIS. The first, uh, one of the very first generation of uh, qualitative or feminist GIS is Maypo Kwan. In 2002, she started doing feminist visualization. Here she, oops. Here she does study the gender and access to employment in Ohio, Colum Columbus, Ohio. Here she studies the space and time path of African uh, American women in Oregon. So she started bringing uh, narratives, everyday journal to map them. Another example of qualitative GIS is uh, Sarah McLaughlin. She uh, studies the a spatial behavior of breast cancer in upstate New York and New York suburban and the relationship of that with some environmental hazard. She went ahead and did talk with this female who had uh, unfortunately breast cancer and she kind of followed them, their path to uh, being recovered from be uh, breast cancer for a while. So what does she suggest? She suggests that we need to highlight the gender geometrics of power. What was happening was that where these environmental hazards located in suburban New York? Are they closer to, are they located in um, a little bit uh, poor neighborhood, in the rich neighborhood? So she was studying and navigating the relationship between um, an emotional geography Imagine you are being told you have a cancer and the emotions that comes with that and another layer where are you le locating, where are the, your house, where is your uh, profession, where do you work, where is your, uh, how close are you to the environmental hazard. Another one is feminist visualization. This is Pavlovskia, Maria Pavlovskia studied the uh, informal economic in Moscow. And that's very important because even in United States, I noticed in San Antonio, we do have a lot of informal economies happening. And a lot of times we don't want to talk about those economy, uh, informal economics. And not all of them are prostitution. There are all kinds of in, uh, informal 
economies, right? Uh, in Tehran, female, women, a lot of women and men are selling goods in sub, uh, Subway. That is not being taxed and it's uh, kind of categorized as informal. So she was able to do a lot of research about a no, uh, kind of like a little bit less known context such as Moscow and she called it feminist uh, visualization. Another example of qualitative GI uh, or qualitative of feminist geography, feminist GIS is what Nightingale a uh, feminist in forest did. She went to Nepal. One of my students here actually is doing similar research, right, Cass? Uh, in uh, Malaysia, if I'm right, or Indonesia, right? Or both. We don't know which one she will get the grant for. But here, she studied the natural resources, right? Which is the forest in Nepal that is being, uh, well, this is kind of hard. But, um, the relationship between the natural resources as a feminist forester or um, feminist environmental manager, she went to Nepal and studied how local people in Nepal are defining deforestation or reforestation. What kind of meanings and emotions, right? Uh, the, peop the Nepalese people are associating with their forests rather than us as a Western who have corporation there to use the resources, what kind of values they are attaching versus us, right? So that's another kind of example of human dimension of global change. That's one of the newer kind of specialty group in, at AAG. Another very good example and kind of related to what I'm going to talk about is another work with Mei Po Kwan right, and Carnegie and Cope. Uh, they called their work grounded visualization or geoethnography. What did they do? Let's go to, oops, let's go to Kwan. She studied a one woman, a female, uh, a woman called Neda in a Humbus, Colum in Columbus, Ohio, right, um, right after the 9-11. And she noticed that Right after the 9-11, her spatial behavior changed drastically, right? Because she was Muslim, she had a head scarf, and she wasn't able to kind of move around the area because of the Islamophobia and other terrorist things that was happening, right? So it was very interesting. She actually mapped the space and time and her narratives and to study what's happening after the 9-11. Kennedy uh, and Cope for, actually I think it's her dissertation, Kennedy's dissertation, what did she do? She actually studied community gardens. Where are they located? Another student of mine is interested in community gardens and food deserts in San Antonio and Austin and Detroit, right, Karen? So here, Kennedy studied where these community gardens are located and what kind of social capital they are producing, what other type of experiences, learnings happening at the community gardens, right, in uh, Buffalo, I think. So she was uh, studying a little bit emotion, qualitative data, and bring it to the location of this. Where are these community gardens are actually located? In a better, in a, let's say, economically well, um, well or education high, what kind of neighborhood? What are the social demographic characteristics of those neighborhoods? So she, she brings different layers, right? Make the GIS sandwich to study what's going on. As you can see, she brings pictures, which is very qualitative data, right? You can, again, as a picture, you can see me or my picture and imagine I'm that or imagine I'm that. Maybe your perception after this talk will change about when you see me out there, right? So let's get to the point, my uh, kind of research. What I, what I did in Iran, um, I like to call it geo-visualization. I brought the geo-ethnography or GIS into ethnographic method. What I am interested in is public spaces and how public spaces are defined and redefined. And I'm mostly interested in physical public spaces because I know 
a lot of you these days are using Facebook, virtual public spaces, but I'm mostly, I'm a very in-person person, so I prefer those kind of questions. But why did I study why I came with that question? The reason was I was an architect and urban planner, practicing urban planning, and I was reading these Western theories, right? We do have a rich uh, kind of uh, literature against criticizing, against modern privatized public spaces, such as shopping malls or other kind of uh, modern public spaces that in Western context have been very much privatized and commercialized. And based on the Western theories, we learn or we can expect that there are not going to be that many people using them, especially female and other minorities. But in reality, so imagine me in the library reading Western theories uh, and uh, going uh, to Tehran's public spaces and seeing that was not really happening. So the praxis, the connecting the practice and theory wasn't really happening for me. So I had that challenge and I started studying that in Tehran public spaces. So a quick background uh, about Tehran. As you can see, Tehran at night look a little bit like Seattle. I have kind of uh, fooled my students with that picture about Seattle. But Tehran or Iran is a very interesting case, not just because it's my homeland, because it has a very contrasting uh, history. Tehran or Iran, Iranian culture is very much uh, related to its pre-Islamic history or Hakamanishian or the dynasty, the kingdom that was happening in Iran, very much from borrowing, it's borrowing from the West, right? Westernization, Americanization, all of those globalization, and at the end to the Islam, which in seventh century uh, Iran was occupied and kind of forcefully changed to Islam from Zoroastrian. So it is a very, very hybrid identity. So this is a map of Tehran produced by GIS, very simple map showing that how Tehran, like many American cities, is socially and especially segregated, right? So here we have the more uh, higher medium income class, and here we have lower income class, as you can see. Um, Deep-seated tradition and wild modernity, and I'm going to have some pictures showing you how these two very contrasting things are kind of navigating and uh, kind of working together. This is GAP, right? Remember, we did just got signed the Iran, Iran uh, nuclear. Even during the sanction against Iran, we had American for some reason. I don't know how. We still had American uh, fashion, and look at the legs. That's quite nice there for right in an Islamic country. And the same here. So you don't really, I mean, not all the women you see in Tehran are going to be in the black chador or black burqa. That's what we see often in American mass media, right? So b before I get to my research. Let's talk a little bit about the politics of hijab because that's something I did record, the appearance of people while I was doing my research. So the politics of hijab is very important. A little bit history about Iran. Iran or Persian Empire coming from uh, like BC, is 800 BC is happening and believing in Zoroastrian religion and in 7th century was forcefully in, uh, occupied by the Arabs and become Muslim. So we do have a really long history of Islam and its kind of messy relationship with the Iranian Zoroastrian or other religion. So right now, majority of the things you see in the mass media would be this and this and this Iranian women. And maybe this, this is the fashion police forcing another resident of Tehran to go to this police car, right? We have our own problem, right? So with, uh, because her hijab or her covering is not good. You see this kind of talking, it's going to work. It seems she's not going to arrest her. That's good. But you can also see different kind of uh, hijab. A lot of Iranian 
are trying to kind of be fashionable, using the fashion and bringing fashion into, I mean, some of them are looking much nicer than some of my students showing up or my colleagues showing up, right? or myself, sorry about that, right? So they are kind of dressing up because that's the only way you can dress up, right, and be attracted. So just wanting to know, uh, let you know that we have a wide, diverse hijab, the definition of hijab, and it goes with the fashion, you know, it's very contrasting. It's bringing a very, very messy navigation. So these were the things that I was actually um, recording. This goes back to feminist geography, the multiple words I was talking. So if you see these or these, you might have that oppressive kind of thought about Iranian women, right? I do like a little bit talk about uh, our invasion to Afghanistan and how Laura Bush did come out in 2005 and did talk that we need to go save Muslim women, right? So uh, I'm hoping after this presentation, we kind of know this is happening too. It's not that black and white that sometimes our politicians are trying to tell us, right? So what I did, I went ahead and gathered all kinds of data. The first data I gathered was spatial behavior maps. Before I go through my data, let me tell you what I was trying to answer. And that was um, how Iranian women presence and use being affected by the design. Is it traditional or modern public spaces? And also by the location, right? Is it in the southern Tehran or is it in the northern Tehran, which is more liberal, less, lit uh, less uh, religious, and more modern architecture? So as you see, I am kind of contrasting um, different public spaces to go back to the Western criticism of public, privatized, modern public spaces, specifically in the United States. So the first level is the spatial behavior map, mapping, very time consuming. That's why uh, doing feminist geography or any kind of ethnographic work is going to be expensive to do at, uh, at the university level. Then I did take pictures, and I do love to sketch architecture. So that was the great excuse for me to take my time, right, and stay a little bit more uh, in my hometown and do architecture sketch, because I think they do b kind of uh, convey the message, the sense of place, right? Then I did semi-structure interviews with more than 100 uh, female who uh, voluntarily, I mean, I approached them and voluntarily talked to me over an hour, an hour and a half, and it was very good because this time I was going as a researcher to my hometown, not as a resident. So I was learning so much about the country or about this city I was living there for majority of my time. And uh, my last layer is the GIS layer. Uh, I did kind of uh, use the kernel distance density tool, and I did uh, contrast the female usage and male usage. I don't have time to go too much into too much detail here about what I did for my research, but I do want to tell you what the um, uh, conclusions were. So what I did, I grabbed all of these different data. I did talk with female, women, that's another contrasting or interesting uh, picture. As you can see, this woman has a black is kind of dressed conservatively, guess what she's selling? What does that look? Bras, right? Very personal, right? That's me back in 2012 in Tehran, trying to talk, those are some of my interviewees. So I, and this is the pictures. Oh yes, we do hold hands, right? All of those things happening in uh, Iran too. So what I tried to do is that triangling, right? One of the uh, way that we do research, objective data, GIS, subjective, the female narratives that I might talk, and the other one, the intersubjective, putting all of those together and see what is the pattern, what all of these interviews are telling me, right? What are women, female narratives telling me? So at the end of it, I came to this conclusion that women's users in Tehran's public spaces preferred 
modern privatized public spaces because of two main reasons. First, they didn't let police, the fashion police being there usually, let's say in shopping malls, they didn't because it's mostly owned by private investment or private uh, businesses, they didn't let the fashion police come. So you could actually sit down and uh, drink coffee and hold your boyfriend's hand or if you're a female and you don't really want to be uh, seen in like pe uh, public or traditional public spaces smoking, which can kind of uh, against the norm. As a female, you can do that in those pub privatized modern public spaces. Another thing is that a lot of those females in those public spaces, in the northern Tehran, in modern public spaces, they were telling me they actually prefer that. They come all the way from southern Tehran to enjoy the freedom, the self-freedom, the feelings of um, being equal to male users, right? Because they were kind of becoming themselves, were coming out of their neighborhoods, right? Going to the north in the, kind of getting lost in the city. Nobody really knows you. So based on these narratives that I gathered in these two contrasting public spaces, right? I uh, came to conclusion that we cannot, right, simply transfer Western uh, theories that, is, that might actually work in American context when they were writing it back in 2000 and uh, late 90s to Iran today because we do need to pay attention to those ethnographic or uh, societal cultural meanings that we attach to places. So based on my research again, uh, I learned so much about GIS itself. I used many different tools of GIS to bring qualitative data. I noticed that these um, uh, social processes attaching different meanings to public spaces by women are actually specialized. Right, so it really depends where the, uh, the, uh, these public spaces are located. So the speciality of s social uh, processes was another thing that I learned. And um, I would kind of like to conclude my uh, uh, talk today by questioning actually what uh, Krieger and Dennis claimed. You can map just about any data you can collect from the environment. And I praise them, that's very correct. Uh, GIS, thanks to Esri and other producer of GIS or any kind of mapping technology, we can map a lot of things. We can map uh, uh, rebels, right, voices. We can map uh, uh, behavior, ma behavior, social behavior mapping. We can map pictures, we can map music these days, right? We can map videos, the story map. I, I noticed that in your uh, program, you did have a lab. Esri had a lab for mapping a story, right? Map a story online. So all of those, but are they inclusive? Are they meaningful way, right? Those are, that's what I actually uh, question. So I would like to conclude by this very good sentence, powerful sentence of Scott back in 1998 which he wasn't really talking about GIS, but he did mention that a state, right, the public, right, the public I meant, sorry, the people, us, who knows, right, the public that is aware of the ways states, capitals, and or militaries, technology, and policies can alter its, their life will better know and follow an interest, meaning that us as minority, female, disabled, LGBT, uh, homeless, right? I was earlier talking with Bani. Is Bani here? She was um, uh, talking about how she's thinking about connecting um, uh, unemployed female and learn them, teach them GIS and get them some jobs. So if we do equip ourselves with a technology that's very much our state, our military, our capitalist um, industry are using, we as public would be more aware of what is our goal and we can kind of define uh, our community, our local needs and get them better. 
Um, so that's about it. We can talk about more if you have any question about my specific uh, um, research in Tehran, I would be willing to talk about it more, but I try to just give away or talk about the idea of feminist GIS. How can we bring more qualitative ethnography to empower minorities? Remember, what I'm kind of celebrating here is GIS as a tool, not as a remedy or solution, but as a tool to better understand each other. If we do try to better understand each other in different ways, we would be having a more peaceful world. So that's what I'm hoping to kind of introduce a different way of seeing each other. And if we understand each other better, we become closer and more peaceful. If you haven't learned anything from my uh, presentation, it didn't really uh, attract you, I'm going to teach you one word, Farsi or Persian. It's sepas, meaning thanks. So thank you all for coming, sepas. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Bagheri? It was a very interesting talk. Yes. 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 What is your name? I'm Teresa Howard. Teresa Howard. Thank you for that comment. It's very good. Yes. Big data is another kind of the new uh, kind of wave of GIS. We are kind of uh, excited. We were excited about the GIS and qualitative, and now the big data. How we, right, as a citizen, can change the world, basically. Another example. Those of you might not be uh, kind of related or aware of big data. Let's just think about the Yelp. Last night, Richard, probably you kind of indulged them with good, uh, good food and good drinks. And then later on, you're going to say, Tendris was great, the drink was great. Or this, uh, uh, some of my students are going to write down the I-35 is really bad. Meaning, <laughs> driving up, not worth it. Especially those of you who are not getting any grade from me, right? So uh, big data, the wave that's coming is each of us have a power, right, to produce our own data. So there's a huge data there. Like uh, Facebook, which recently, not very recently, but it has been recently commercialized too, if I'm right, right? So by this big data, we as citizen can mobilize social change. In my case, feminist change. Change, we are committed to societal, change, right, as feminists. We just don't want to write. We also want to see some changes in the society, right? We want a better uh, treatment to our minorities, African-American, LGBT, blah, blah, blah. Going back to the state of mind, Texas, we are going to change that a little bit. But uh, hopefully, not offending, hopefully. But uh, the big data is, if I'm answering you just very quickly, if there's any other question, is that we do have the power and again, those uh, um, websites like Facebook or corporation also can direct us to different paths of either against what is our goal, right, with their advertisement, or what is for our goods. Is that what you meant, right? So yeah, big data in days of uh, presidential debate is very important. And we are very emotionally attached to this. Like when you see all of those uh, tweets, thankfully I don't have a Twitter, I would be really busy right that way, but um, I mean we can change public thoughts, how we are thinking, we are very emo, how many of you vote, voted? Oh very good, that's awesome, great, so uh, with this big wave of 
big data, right, that all of us can produce data, we can choose which future do we want. So, and we can be manipulated. That's what I think you mostly mentioned. So if we do know and we pay attention what's going on with the technology, we hopefully just uh, follow our own goals. Sorry, I did talk oh, a little bit okay. too much. Other questions? Um, right? Yes. Can you speak a little bit louder, please? Yes. Very good question, sir. What's your name? What's that? Alduri. Al Mr. Alduri, thank you so much. That's a very good question about Iran. I'm glad that somebody brought that, right? It, I do talk about it when I uh, present my own research. Yes, as you might also know, uh, around 30 years ago, 1979, 79 AD, and I was born after, thankfully, right? So the uh, revolution, Islamic revolution happened in Iran. And we, a lot of Iranians, do blame Reagan, right? Or the, at the time, the American uh, politics, the foreign politics of America in the Middle East, especially in Iran. So we have a change of the kingdom system Reza Shah and Mohammad Shah to more like a Khomeini and now Khomeini, a little bit, not a little bit, very much forceful mandatory hijab and Islamic. So we have this secular, a little bit more similar to Turkey before 1979. You can't believe my mom went like this or not even with the socks to uh, college, Tehran University. But after that, you had to have the hijab. So what happens is that after 1979, you actually see women are using public spaces even more. And what is the reason? There's two important reasons. Number one, Iranian traditional family, because of the fact of hijab, they felt a little bit more comfortable sending their uh, children, mothers, daughters, whatever, to public spaces, specifically universities, 65 percent of, Irani uh, of Iranian students in college are women, uh, much higher than kind of uh, world average. And the second uh, reason that we have a huge presence, uh, presence of women in Iran public, um, Tehran public spaces was the Iran-Iraq war, if you remember that. Uh, that happened in 1980 to 88, around that eight areas. That was a very dark time in Tehran, right? So a, a lot of men are going to the war, working out, and a lot of women are coming out to public spaces, getting jobs, trying to feed their family. So right after the Islamic Revolution, surprisingly, we see much more presence of Iranian women in public spaces for those two reasons. Did I answer your question, Mr. Yeah. Abdelorni? That sounds familiar, like a familiar story. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. I saw a question over here. Linda. Very good question, Linda. Mm -hmm. Very good question, Linda. And we are having kind of similar uh, situation with Jonathan, one of my students who is studying LGBT homeless in San Antonio. The same with Iranian women. So we started, I started as a covert researcher. So when I was doing my, um, yeah, the covert, like going back with your tracking, you know, secretive tracking goodies, and I need some of those for my students. But, <laughs> right? So I went as a covert. I dressed very down like a student. I did put the specific hijab, if we can go back. So the dress code matters, right, and how you present yourself. That's thank you so much. That's another thing which, oops, here. So this is one of them. That's, see, I dressed mostly like this in between very conservative and not very conservative. So I kind of tried to dress down, look like a student, look like a very normal person. I did do my sketching and social behavior. But when I did go talk with women, I did introduce myself as a researcher and as a feminist. And 
for some reason, majority of them were very open to talk with me. And I think the reason was I did explain what is my goal. I did explain that um, uh, I'm like you. I just left Iran a few years ago. And I'm going to tell the story of us because we are being represented wrong in America or in other Western. So I think what is important there, Linda, is to come down as a researcher, and I don't mean it in a literal word, but come down to the same level of your research subject. The researcher and the research are coming together to meet each other. So the, that goes back to the feminist politics of knowledge, who is producing knowledge. Is uh, Rich going there to Tehran? I'm just using your name, right? Going to Tehran to see uh, back and forth what's going on with not knowing the meaning behind our body languages or the hijab style, right? So you want to actually get familiarize yourself with the local, with the context, and bring yourself to the researched, you know? And it takes time. You do need extensive time to build that trust. I'm hoping that Jonathan, who's going to he, um, study uh, 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 LGBT in San Antonio, would be happy. I mean, would be successful. So we need to build that trust through time, through understanding each other. That there is no state, there is no propaganda, there is nothing against you. I'm just going to tell your story, and hopefully that story sharing empower all of us. Did I answer your question? So it's going, you are going to take so much time to build that trust by dress codes, the language you use, no jargon, right? Other questions? Thank you. I have to, I have to say that right now we are uh, dealing with an obstacle, um, both. Uh, Nazgul and I didn't wear the proper attire, like we didn't wear our pantsuits, we probably should have today, because this lavalier is not cooperating with us, so, so an another yeah, barrier that we have to deal with, but that's okay. Um, we do, uh, it is 10 o'clock, and so it's break time. You're going to be around yes. for a while, all day? Yes, okay. hopefully, yes. So please look for Nazgul, give her a big round of applause. Thank she you. was great. And we'll see you outside.